a lot of people don't know who the Conservation Foundation is, and we are your land trust that covers the page. We also cover Kane, Kendall, Will, sometimes Grundy, LaSalle, DeKalb counties, our main offices in Naperville on the McDonald farm. And the farm dates back to the 1870s. And yet we've updated it with all this green infrastructure, what they call it. We've added solar panels, wind turbine, a green roof, two different types of rain harvesting, rain barrels, composting. All of these things happen right here on the farm. And we've talked to the village about um, one of the ideas we've thrown out there was to have a welcome to Downers Grove welcome day. And everybody from Downers Grove could come to the farm on a certain day and get a tour of the farm and see some of the activities that we've got going. You could buy a rain barrel or a composter, but you're certainly welcome to contact me at the end. I'll leave my information about a lot of the things I'll talk about tonight that you can, um, if you don't ask questions tonight, you can always contact me and um, I'll help you later. Why I'm doing these programs is the second line there. 95% of the property in, in Illinois is private. So if we want Downers Grove to be nice, if we want DuPage County to be nice, we have to work on private property sites. And many people think that I am a nature guy that you're listening to tonight, but the answer is we're all nature people. And if you look at our experiences, if I asked you about your experiences, you'd tell me that you used to go to your grandpa's farm up in Wisconsin, or you used to go fishing with your dad or all these wonderful experiences that we've had. And in this book by Stephen Kellert, he explains that we're not gonna be healthy and happy if we're apart from the world, we environment, the environment that we evolved from. So I guided my son to his first big muskie or we're hiking the Appalachian Trail here. We need to be outside and outside more and having a connection in nature is gonna make us happier. My daughter here is dancing in the Mediterranean at two in the morning, my son and his best friend. If you look at yourself, you know, you, where you go on vacation, other than maybe Las Vegas or New York, everywhere else has a beautiful component. I just went to Mexico and swam with whale sharks and, and people go to Florida in the winter to get near the ocean. Um, we go to Maine in the summer to see the beautiful trees or we, go to Wisconsin Lake House or Michigan. Uh, whether we know it or not, we're connected to nature. And so that's what I try to do with the Conservation at Home program is bring a little of that nature home. We don't get to the forest preserve every day. We don't get to hike in the park every day. So why don't we have a little nature preserve in our own yards? So we can enjoy it more often. And with Carol and this bluebird story, um, they call, they live in Wayne and they had trees that they couldn't identify. So I went out there and I said, this is invasive buckthorn and that one is invasive honeysuckle. And they said, well, 80% of our trees are bad, you're saying. And I said, well, yeah, they should be down. Well, about a year later, they called and they said, we're done. And I said, what do you mean you're done? And she said, yeah, we cut all the trees down. My husband got a light on a helmet light and uh, a special saw and he started cutting. And I said, that is just wonderful. So they got their sign for their yard. And I said, Carol, now you need a bluebird house. And she said, Jim, we've lived here for 17 years. We've never had a bluebird. And I said, well, you never had an open savanna like this. And no more than the words came out of my mouth, in comes the bluebird. And she said, well, did you have that in your car? So it does work when we change the landscapes to support the wildlife, then we can get those wildlife to come. Um, many of the things that I talk about are simple things um, with the rain coming down now. A lot of people have issues with water in their yard, um, attracting wildlife, less chemical use, less grass. I'll talk about that later. Healthy soils and more oaks and diverse trees. And we've been overplanting the wrong things for years. So simple things we're going to talk about and understanding that we're animals and we are connected to nature. We're water and we are born from water and we're 75% water as we move around now. So it's not odd that we have this attraction to be near a lake. Uh, I've got some realtor friends and you know, anything lake shore, lake view, 
extra money. People want to be near that water. And it isn't odd. We have to understand that that's natural. And this book by Brownfield, um, it's the war on our natural assets. And you see it all around us. We're paving over things. We're uh, spraying chemicals on everything. We're killing off the wildlife. Uh, you know, it's destruction is going on all over the world. My son flipped on the TV and there was one of those gold rush shows. And this big piece of moving equipment was just digging into this creek up in in um, pristine area of Alaska, and it just made me sick. But where it all starts is that plants are the basis of life on this planet. There is no life without plants. So the plants are the only thing that can take the sun and make food from it. So everything else goes from plants. The water we have, the air we breathe, everything was derived from plants. And the reason that there aren't, isn't rich life on Mars is it's not very hospitable to plants. This planet was a plant, uh, was able to start plants and the plants then created a, a good atmosphere for more things to continue to grow. So if we understand that plants are not decorative things, we shouldn't think of them as decorative, they are essential for life. So that is a building block the next step is it makes a difference what type of plants we put. So right now, the monarchs are on their way here. The, the birds that fly south for the winter, including this hummingbird, they're on their way back. And they're coming for one reason. They're coming for bugs. And they come to your yard. They scan your yard. They look at it, say, nah, nothing here for me. And they go on. So we make a decision what we want in our yard. And that decision has ramifications about what other creatures can live off of what we've chosen. And in the evolutionary world, we understand that a turtle has a shell that protects it and that a cheetah can run fast to catch the gazelle or a giraffe has a long neck to eat the acacia leaves. But we don't see evolution in plants and we don't appreciate it the same way. These plants, the native plants from Illinois are going down deeper than an oak tree and they're enriching the soil as they cast off 25% of their root mass into the soil every year. The rich topsoil was created here. When you think about all this rich black dirt that was not brought here by a glacier, that was created by these plant life in the prairie over tens of thousands of years. And we've scraped it off. We've done all kinds of horrible things with it in our yards. Many of the subdivision yards you have are compacted clay with rock where the topsoil has been stripped away. And now we're trying to deal with it. And some of these plants will help us with that. And when I'm trying to sell the idea, look at the beautiful plants we can choose from. And there's a whole host of other ones, but these are just some of the more attractive ones that we can use in our yards very easily. My bluebells are coming up now. And they're going to give me a nice carpet of blue in the shade. So that's what I'm talking about is we can have pretty and function in our yard and attract birds and butterflies and still not lose much in, um, in aesthetic value. This is uh, Lyman Woods right in um, on 31st and Highland Avenue. And we now are working with 3,000 homes across the region, eight different organizations working our program. But the Conservation Foundation is the one that's covering DuPage County and Downers Grove specifically. This is a home in Glen Ellen that they don't even have any front yard. It's all native plantings. That orange is milkweed. I'll tell you about it later. But we can do this. And you don't have to go all the way out like this. But I show you some people are going all the way and they love it. This is a representation of the different projects we've worked on across the area. Mine are covered in the bright red in this area. And the other organizations are here in blue and this crimson, purple, green, um, all across the area. So if you have friends that live in Lake County or McHenry or all the way out to Rockford, we can help you implement some of these programs all over. And it isn't just residential properties. We do uh, commercial properties, hospitals, um, gardens, centers, 
gardens, you know, um, corporate sites, you name it, we can cover it and implement these same things I'm talking about on any different type of property. We now have over 165 different uh, corporate sites that we have worked on. The idea is it's gonna bring you something better. This Menarda bee balm here, right by this pear tree is going to attract pollinators and they're gonna pollinate the pear tree when it needs to be pollinated and we'll have more pears. So your tomatoes can be better. Your peppers and zucchini will be better if we incorporate flowers near our vegetable gardens. So it, there's a bunch of things it's doing for us. It's increasing the, the beauty and it's increasing the pollinators that are staying longer periods of time in our garden. They may not just find this flower when it needs to be pollinated, but by having them right here, there's a much better chance they're gonna find and be able to pollinate these um, other things that we want for our gardening. A lot of us are not playing soccer in the park anymore, but a lot of park districts are converting a lot of their areas into high quality natural areas. I saw mink swim across the creek here when I was standing on the bridge. And we can enjoy this with our grandchildren, our children, walking the dog, and the park districts are not gonna be trying to mow all these areas that should be natural areas. This was one in Naperville Park District where this was just a mud hole and it was like a water kept sitting in here. Now it's no longer a ditch, it's a bioswale. And we have a place for the bunny to hide in here when the tractors are coming by mowing. They do less mowing with this and the water doesn't sit in here anymore. All that root system opens up the soil and the water per percolates down. So it's a win-win situation. Park District mows less, which saves them money, which saves us tax money, and we have habitat also. My granddaughter and daughter-in-law were in downtown Chicago, and they found a milkweed growing in the crack of the sidewalk, right on the edge, and on the milkweed is, guess what, the monarch, and my engineer daughter-in-law was saying why would a monarch fly into downtown Chicago and why would it think that's a good place to go but it did and it opened their eyes to this whole system of of the monarchs they ended up taking home uh, a couple of larvae that I set them up with and my granddaughter named the three of them Coco Super and Banana and they watched the transformation of these and it even shocked my daughter-in-law to say, how in the world does a white, green, and black striped worm come out orange? And you can't think that that orange butterfly is going to fly to Mexico. And this was in September. And I said, it, that's what it needs to do. And it's pre-programmed. And even the thought of, you know, she's raising my granddaughter. And nobody raises these monarchs. They're, they're left mother lays the egg and they're gone. There's everything is pre-programmed into them that they ever need to do. And it's, it is an amazing story and it shocks people. And it, it's just mind blowing to think all of this can happen right around us. So the simplest thing, like you see a bug there, it's not that simple. It's, it's a whole complicated program. And even the fact that they're sitting on the, on the milkweed, milkweed is poisonous. And They've adapted over the years, they've evolved where the caterpillar will eat the poison and become poisonous. They pupate into the butterfly and become poisonous in the butterfly form. So birds learn, don't eat the orange one, They're, they taste bad and they make me sick. Won't necessarily kill a bird, but it, after they tasted one, they will never wanna do it again. So there's all this natural things going on and things we can learn. And it's amazing. And to bring that into our backyard is, is an amazing thing. They've since, um, my daughter-in-law and son have bought a home now and absolutely we had to plant milkweed. So my background, I used to own a hardware store and I convinced the Conservation Foundation that problem solving is really what we need. And I can help you with water, 
helping your soil, attracting wildlife, growing things. People tell me that they have a brown thumb and they can't grow anything. Well, try growing the things that were meant for your yard. The prairie that was there for 10,000 years, it grows much better with less work than trying to put in Japanese barberry or Japanese this or Asian that. Um, so a lot of things we can do that will be simple and make it easier for us. I went to one lady's yard and she said, come in the back and see where the lake is. And when I got back there, I took this picture because obviously the lake is gone. But the conditions from April, May to this was shot in, I think, July, very different conditions that can exist. And these plants have to be adaptable. This is showing you that there is compacted clay, very little rich soil here. And this dirt here is screaming for organic material. So a composter, keeping all the leaves that you have in your yard, all the kitchen scraps, all of the organic material that you have that we've been throwing away, we need to put it back in the soil. So a composter is a very easy way. We're selling these at a low price to encourage people to do it. And we help people learn. I have um, videos all about composting and about rain barrels. So you can contact me for any of these um, easy to take steps. Birds are an easy thing for me to sell. The top right and bottom left are both invasive species. They don't belong in Illinois and they're overloaded here. They've adapted very well to suburban landscape and we don't want them here. Certainly not in the count. 50% of the birds were in these four. This one I'll talk about later. Grackles and geese are both native. However, they're out of control because of what we've done with suburbia and they've adapted to suburbia so well that they're dominating now and causing problems. These aren't the birds you want. You want the good birds. And understanding that this grouping of birds will come to a bird feeder, but they cannot find sustainable food year round from a bird feeder, it just doesn't work. This hummingbird, if you put out the hummingbird feeder, you know you put sugar water in the cup and they can't sustain themselves from sugar water. That's similar to me drinking a Pepsi it's a little boost of sugar, but it cannot sustain me. These birds live off of bugs. During the winter time, they scrounge for dead bugs. Um, woodpeckers find them in the wood and they can switch to seeds. This grouping just flies south. They only eat bugs and they go south where they can eat bugs in the, in the winter time and they come back. They're coming back now. We see things like this wren. We want a wren to come, they sing so beautifully. We put out a wren house, we don't have a clue what they eat. They never come to a bird feeder. You want the indigo bunting to come, he doesn't come to a bird feeder. Some of the birds like this tanager or orioles will come to a bird feeder periodically, but what are they coming for? They're coming for grape jelly. And that's again, just sugar. So they can taste the sugar, they can get a little something from it, but it's not sustainable. They're eating bugs and the bugs are on the plants, the native plants from Illinois, the bugs have adapted to the plants, the plants bring the birds, the birds bring the hawk, the whole thing works from a plant base. And we either have it or we don't in our yards. Some of the birds like the cedar waxwing and the oriole and tanager will switch somewhat in the summer to berries. If you have a service berry or viburnum, chokeberry, you can attract some of these birds with um, the summer fruiting berries, or we could grow other plants. These are seed bearing plants that we can easily grow in our gardens. And you're seeing here a, a goldfinch eating the um, black eyed Susan head. The poster child for all of nature is the monarch. And, but understanding that it's the ecosystem we're trying to go for. So people love butterflies. Very few people ask me, can you help me bring more snakes? 
or skunks to my yard, or I want that possum, that ugly looking gray possum to come to my yard. Now they, you want the butterflies, you want the birds, but the rest of nature will come along. When I build butterfly gardens in the schools, the bees come along, but they're just, you don't see them as much if you're like looking for butterflies, the bees come, in, come and go and do what they do. Bees are actually doing the pollinating far greater than anything else. They do 80 to 90% of the pollinating. So, but they're under the radar and people don't like them because they possibly could sting. But the, the bumblebees and the native bees that we have are not the ones that are stinging. So I try to bring that education out to people that we really want a full working ecosystem. And it's pretty simple things. You know, they, they're looking for nectar. It isn't all about milkweed. This milkweed here, I took a picture of it because it was just defoliated from the eating of um, the leaves from these caterpillars. And typically uh, one monarch will only lay one egg on a plant because of um, she wants to create diversity. So she lays one egg here, flies to another yard, lays another egg and on and on. But obviously there were several monarchs that um, were on these and defoliated them. So it's simple things, they want food, they want water and a place for, they, for them to rest. And they're migrating through, some of them stay, but some of them go all the way up to Mexico. They're from Mexico to Canada and back. Many of them go into Wisconsin, Minnesota and Michigan from here. And when we look around this, our yards, this is one from Naperville and many, much of it is just poor. And so, I'm challenging you to look at your yard or look at place you work and see landscapes that are just not working right well. And could we do something with this? So they came to us and said, could you fix this? Well, I kind of laughed because the worse it looks, the more amazing I can make it look at the end. So you can become a hero from fixing it from bad to good. We got donations for this walkway. We put clumps of plants. Some of the trick to make them pretty are use clumps and make it look uniform. And how would we do this on a residential site, for example? And this one, the people complain the water from the downspout here would go onto the sidewalk. And they have no birds, they have no butterflies. They have to, the water becomes a problem with wet shoes in the summer. In the wintertime, it's ice that has formed on the sidewalk and they have to put salt, the salt kills the grass, the whole problem, and it's not working. Now notice the big arborvita here. That was one of the first things that we removed. But look at that beautiful brickwork and stone. And the issue with the downspout was the grass was higher than the sidewalk. So it's not rocket science, we need to lower where we want the water to go. We wanted the water in this case to go this way. So we lowered it down over here and gave the water a place to go, no more on the sidewalk. We created a defined edge with the grass here and it looks neat and orderly. We planted plants in clumps and they have birds and butterflies coming back, water issues gone and less mowing. So if you wonder, about plants, all you do is Google. And I put the answers to the typical plants. This is the top listing of typical plants in our yards and where they came from. You could add roses. Uh, there's a lot of things. And I'm not saying that these are bad. I'm saying that they are inert. They, they're they not connected to the environment. So they're just decorative. And if you want, lilac it's got a beautiful smell and you can say i i want it anyway i know it's decorative but i want it anyway that's fine but understanding that if we cover all of our yard with non-functional plants then we're not going to have the birds or the butterflies water is not going to absorb and go down into the ground like it should and we may have non-functioning landscapes in the house we wouldn't think of of having a house without function. We need the microwave, we need the stove, the refrigerator, the couch, the bed. Then we decorate around the functional parts. 
we could put a, a picture up on the wall or um, something on the mantle of a fireplace. Those are all decorative little things that we put around the house, but the base is always the functional things. And we don't think about the yard that way. We've covered large areas with grass. Geese love grass. They are afraid of predators like dogs, coyotes, and fox, and they need space to fly. So they have to have a long distance of view so that they can get flying if there is a predator coming. They're fat and lazy. They just wanna walk in the water and walk out. I don't wanna put a blanket down here and have a picnic with my granddaughter. I know this has got chemicals on it because there isn't any dandelions and it's full of goose poop. This isn't a good place to fish. So why do we do that? Why can't we have a better shoreline that is not gonna be eroding and doesn't attract the geese? So in this picture, we might have a heron or a egret in the water and they're eating frogs and crayfish. And so it would be better for fishing. And we have diverse landscape with many different things that are attracting praying mantis and toads and frogs. And there's habitat for all kinds of things. The shoreline is not eroding because of those deep root systems. The water is actually cleaner because these plantings actually pull the pollutants out of the water. So I have to try to convince these homeowners that this is better than the grass mowed pond. We've been doing the wrong things with our lawn. I used to sell fertilizer. This number on the bag, look at it when you go to buy one, $50 bag of fertilizer, and it's overloaded in nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, that the overloading of nitrogen makes the blades grow quicker. And that's really not what you want. You don't want fast blade growth. You're gonna to have to mow it twice a week during May. And what you want is healthy. We know grass doesn't have a root system. You can buy it, you know, in a roll. And we're putting all this chemicals on this grass and it's not working. We're covering the United States in grass. So the gr dark green are states that have grass more than any other landscape. So in Illinois, there's more grass than corn and soybeans together. And the states that don't have grass dominating are mountainous or sparsely populated areas. So out in the desert in Nevada, uh, you can see why there wouldn't be grass there. And Nebraska, Nebraska and Kansas have lower populations. As people come, more and more people will demand having this, our grass. And it's not a good thing for um, the ecology. We spent $40 billion on grass, 20 million acres of an unproductive crop. It's not growing broccoli for the poor. It's literally called biologically dead. It does not support any wildlife other than Japanese beetle grubs in our lawns. We're mowing it, we're watering it. We spend $99 billion on grass care um, annually. That's total, not just individual homes. Um, and the average homeowner spends over $500 on it. So does it make sense that the surface on the left is what we've chosen to cover the United States with? On the right is a natural area in Geneva. The orange is milkweed blooming in the middle of a drought. And we've got coneflowers and um, indigo and um, all these beautiful plants. And yet, where would we look if we were walking down this path? Where would the bugs and the birds and the bunnies be hiding? What is prettier? And yet, what do we choose to cover the biggest part of our state in? Does it make sense to you? I do a lot of information about trees. The best trees can be listed. Doug Tallamy in his books has listed the quality of the trees based on the ecological value of that tree. And we've loaded our yards with maple and honey locust right now. We had ash, they got wiped out. We didn't learn from the elm and they got wiped out. We have way too many Bradford pear. They're gonna be listed as an invasive species in the near future. We have buckthorn honeysuckle and we need to create diverse 
tree canopies that have no more than 10 to 15% of any one species that would give us safety in our trees so that we're not gonna lose um, them all. Maples were sitting around 30%, which is twice the amount we should have. Same thing with honey locusts right now. Ash was 30% and now it went to zero. Grass is not good for trees. So I went to this house, this is a white oak. And they said, oh, we love this tree. This is, this is the main tree. This is the tree we bought the house for. Get the grass off the tree. Grass was never meant to be in the woods. And it doesn't do well for the tree. It weakens the tree, makes it more susceptible to damage by bugs. The roots oftentimes come up trying to get air. They don't get passage of air or water very well over grass. All these leaves that are supposed to add organic material to the soil, we won't leave them there. We gotta shred them up and bag them and haul them to the curb because they're gonna kill our grass if we left our grass there with leaves on the grass. So again, we're doing the wrong things for the trees that we care about. And I tell people, you know, what the shade could look like if we had it forested. These are the bluebells. This is wild geranium. This is Solomon seal, woodland phlox. These are carex, so they're sedges. They look like grass, but you don't have to mow them. And they just fill spaces in the shade. It's a very nice plant. So there's a whole bunch of really nice things that we can put in the shade. We've been paving over things at a high rate. You see that everywhere you go. And it's led to drainage problems runoff, the technical term is called non-point source pollution. So the pollution coming from pipes is pretty much ended and now it's running off the surface of the land and carrying with it, you know, tons of debris. So it's coming across your yard. You may not see where it goes or maybe you know where it goes. But the idea is all of the communities, we work with DuPage County stormwater and all of the communities on infiltration of the water. Don't dump it into these um, storm drains. The, the system can't handle it during a rainstorm. The rivers are flooded. I went by the DuPage today and it's raging down. And that was before it rained hard this afternoon. So how do we mitigate some of that water? and? They want to have a place for their son to play soccer. They put some Kemlon on it, perhaps. Um, but mitigating it, they have nat native plants up by the house. The house is sloped. And out here, they have a buffer of plants before it gets to the storm drain. So these plants with all that deep root system can suck it up. They have places where they can see birds and butterflies out here in the prairie. And it gets back to, there are ways the terms of rain gardens or catching it with rain barrels, absorbing it in our yards. So we're not just pushing it off into the street, into the storm drain curbs. These, this depiction is the road is higher here and it's draining towards this drain. We planted things upside of the drain so that it has to filter through all of this plant material before it can get into here. Many of you might say, well, I don't live near the river, so it's not, I'm not a problem. Well, we're all connected. So this property is nowhere near the river either, but the other side of the pipe that you don't see is the problem. And all of our water, if you put a rubber duck in the river, East Branch or West Branch of DuPage, they all come together and end up in the Illinois, which ends up in the Mississippi, and they go to New Orleans. So the stuff that runs off your yard can go all the way to Louisiana. So we're trying to stop that as much as we can. And in this picture, my boss and I are out there creating a rain garden. We lowered an area. We're running water from the two downspots. There's another downspot over here you can't see. Notice the air conditioner here. I'll show you that later. These rocks behind me are over the top of this rubber mat and they're gonna slow that water down. So it comes in here as a trickle and we absorb it. So this purple blue in here is um, spiderwort. The white is penstemon. There's interesting uh, here, this is a 
rattlesnake master. We didn't plant it and it just popped up from the soil. And it's a yucca, it's in one of the native yuccas. So it picked a dry spot up, up on the top. And along the top here, we also have prairie drop seed. That's an interesting plant. It's a small clump grass, very, very nice and showy. And it can even break apart gasoline. They're using it in gas stations to mitigate some of the water that comes off the uh, pumps that's carrying um, gas and oil debris. And this plant can metabolize, tear apart the carbon atoms and utilize that carbon and it uh, removes the pollution. So these plants are doing cool things. And that's what we're trying to bring to people is how would I get started? And when I started this program, um, I think we're getting close to 18 years ago, people just kept saying, well, yeah, it all sounds good, but I wouldn't know where to begin. How would I do it? What would I, where would I go? Where would I, how would I plant? And the idea is that you have help. We're a conservation form uh, organization and I will come to your house if necessary. So we have brochures and materials we can give you. And if you need personal assistance, we can come out to your house and look at it. The whole thing we're working with Downers Grove is one of our conservation and community program um, municipalities because they care more. We're so happy to work with Downers Grove. It's one of our um, best municipalities where they care about the environment. and. We want to support that. We want to come out and visit the yards and help them implement these programs. And we can do that for no charge. So you could be, I will invite you to join the program if you want. It's only $50, but you don't have to. I will help you for free. And I will take questions that have in the chat box now. Um, here's my email, my office number. Email is usually easier to get a hold of me. I'm not in the office all the time, especially in this, when the weather gets good in the spring, I am very busy, but I'd be happy to take your questions now or shoot me an email if you have other additional questions you didn't wanna bring up tonight. Thank you, Jim. And, and thank you for the presentation about creating landscapes for birds and butterflies and inviting nature into your yard. Um, Jim was talking about not making sure that there's not grass up to your tree. Another point also is uh, a lot of you may have seen that volcano mulch that goes around, uh, you've seen around trees that is very, that will actually kill your trees in the long run. It's very important to make sure that, um, you know, you don't have that volcano mulch up around uh, the tree base because it will, it will kill it. It causes uh, moisture to build up and then it gets insects and invade, uh, it starts to deteriorate the bark around the tree and it will eventually kill it. Um, so we do have a question that says, how do we get rid of non-native bees or attract, replace them with native bees? Okay, well, the worst non-native ones we have are the yellow jackets and they live in the ground and they're the ones that are buzzing around your can of pop in the summertime. Those are non-native and you can destroy those, no problem. A lot of the other ones we have like the um, paper wasps, those are not native and you get rid of those out of your yard. And the way to attract the other ones is habitat. So you can't bring them other than you, let's put food for them and they will come. So the same thing with the birds, we're gonna create better habitat. The habitat's gonna create a place for the good bugs to come. The birds are gonna come to get the bugs. The whole thing works. So it goes back to, if you've got grass and Japanese this and that and plants that don't support the bugs we're not going to have the bugs and the bees and all of those things so it's it's all about creating habitat and, and someone asked what mulch I mentioned what I mentioned was don't you don't volcano the mulch in other words don't put it up around the base like if this is your tree trunk make sure it doesn't go up on the trunk it should be like a donut around the base of the tree um as far as a mulch, what I would recommend we use is a, a shredded hardwood bark. And if you've, and if you've seen at the uh, hardware store or some of the nurseries around, well, if nurseries sell, but I've seen them at hardware stores. I've seen that dyed bark that's red or gray or black. That all that is is shredded pellets that they've dyed. 
And that is actually not real good for the soil. We had a soil specialist on from the Morton Arboretum and she said that, you know, that's pine. And he says, unless you're in a pine forest, it's not great to put that type of mulch on your, your landscape because it does change your soil. Um, but a shredded hardwood bark is a, a really good uh, mulch to put down. And we recommend, you know, two or three inches. It keeps, uh, keeps your plants moist, but it also, also um, retains the moisture, and it, but it also keeps the weeds out too. Um, someone asked, how about carpenter bees? They nest on porch beams. Well, a lot of the wood, you know, we used to have a forest and there were dead trees that we left up. And so we've removed, of course, we don't let any dead trees stay up in our yards. So we've removed places for the other creatures that live. Um, there's also shortage of homes for like woodpeckers, bluebirds nest in boxes, wrens even, same thing. They're nest dwelling um, they don't make a nest like a robin does, created out of grass. They nest in holes in trees, and the trees are just not being left in suburbia. So what happens is they've got to find something else. So sometimes woodpeckers will peck on the side of your house, or carpenter bees, or we have problems. It's because we've changed the landscape, and we're, we're not thinking about the critters that were here before us. And and I just wanted to bring up too that if you're looking for native plants on our website, we are actually having a uh, native plant sale right now. We, they're categorized by sun, shade. We do have some cultivars and also wet plants. So plants, as Jim mentioned, if you have rain gardens and you have issues, um, there's some plants that are adapted to those wet conditions as he showed you in your, the rain garden that he installed. So if you go on our website now, we do have a plant sale. And I also want to mention that we do, and thank you to Downers Grove Public Works for um, hosting us tonight. And we do have a plant sale coming up in partnership with them. Uh, the plant sale opens up. Uh, it's gonna be on, what you do is you purchase them online in advance and the sale will open up uh, May 9th at 8 a.m. And it runs through May 26th at noon. And the pickup date will be June 9th, Thursday, June 9th from two to 6 p.m. And at the same time, we are also having a rain barrel sale. And in Downers Grove, if you purchase a rain barrel, you can get a rebate for the, and discount some of the, uh, the price there. And if you don't wanna wait for that, the Downers Grove uh, site right now, if you go on the Public Works site for Downers Grove, they have a, a link there uh, to our website to order rain barrels. So someone- It, it always comes to the farm. Our yes. farm is not far away. Yes. We're just off of uh, you know, 75th, uh, if you took 75th to Washington and we're south on Washington. So we're not far from Downers Grove. And again, I'd love to have you, you know, as a group, come on out and we could make a Downers Grove day and you could see the rain barrels and the rain uh, harvesting and the green roof. And we have brochures. That's one disadvantage of having the Zoom. It's nice that you can watch in your jammies in your living room, but I have nice brochures and um plant material um, lists that I can't hand out to you this way, but um, we can certainly get them to you if you ask about it or come out and visit. And there were some comments in the chat that they would like a tour of the farm. So we, we can set that up and we'll talk to Julie about that, about having a Downers Grove day. And, and since uh, you registered for this webinar, we can certainly let you know when that will be. Um, someone asked, what are the best bird houses, boxes to places to live? If you're putting bird box or boxes out, you want to track them. Forget the bat house. That does not work. Um, bluebird houses, if you have large property open, like a prairie kind of area. Wren houses are easy. You can put up, you can look up, uh, Audubon has um, directions where you can make your own birdhouse. I tell people not to buy a generic birdhouse because you'll get a generic bird. We don't want more English sparrows. So we tell people if you put up a birdhouse and a chickadee goes in, wonderful. But if you see sparrows going in and making a nest, we would clean it out. So you don't let the sparrows nest in the in the boxes that we want to put out. So I, I do encourage people to put boxes out. Um, I had one that uh, was taken over. It, I saw the box was all chewed up and I thought, well, what the heck? And I was going to clean it out. A flying squirrel. I have. And so you don't know what's going to take over, but let's put them out there and see what happens. And then again, you're 
you always buy a box that you can open up and you want to clean it out if there's sparrows or starlings or some other you know birds that we don't want to create more habitat for so some the person that was asking about the problems with the bees on their porch they're asking if it would be helpful to put a dead log near their porch yeah having things like that um you know the area that they're using now you can cover it so there's a variety of things you can do to caulk or cover the areas that they're going into and take care of that part of it but yeah the same thing i tell people like if they have um it worked on a couple of homes where they had a woodpecker that was hitting the siding and we put up a, a house on a tree out in the yard and they immediately went into the box and quit banging on the house doesn't always make sense. I mean, sometimes I've heard them banging on the gutters and things and you think, what are they doing? But um, we don't have all the answers for nature, but we certainly have um, a lot of them to help take care of these problems. And, and someone asked, is there anywhere we can obtain monarch, monarch larvae? Okay, you don't wanna, you don't wanna obtain the larvae. You want to grow it and they're on their way here. So I can help you get um, milkweed and we put the plants in our yard and you will have them um, come naturally. The, the whole thing of you know people buying tadpoles and making frogs and you know this is one thing you do not wanna do with Amazon. Yeah, and, and to add to that, so we, in our yard, we have a lot of uh, milkweed and um, it was interesting because I had two places I had uh, milkweed. One was on the side yard near my neighbor who actually they spray their yard. And on the other side of my house, I had no larvae on the milkweed where my neighbors sprayed their lawn. But on the other side, we actually had like 14, uh, well, they all started as eggs. And what you can do if you're in, if, you know, you look for the eggs and I had all these, uh, we had 14 caterpillars at one time. And the one picture that Jim had was actually a swallowtail. Uh, that we had in our yard and swallowtail like dill, parsley, um, I can't think of what else, but they like different plants than, than, the, than the monarch. And that's another, and you could get swallowtails. We had swallowtails in our yard because they like um, a different variety of plant. And, um, and actually a funny story, just two weeks ago, I had, well, at the end of the fall, I had a parsley and a caterpillar grew, grew on it or ate it. And I brought it inside because it was getting so late in the season and it went in the chrysalis and it never came out. And I just left it there all winter. And about two weeks ago, our dog went ballistic barking at it. And here it had come out of its chrysalis two weeks ago. I can't release it because it'll die. They say it'll drink uh, like blue Gatorade or sugar water, but I actually went called Wanamakers and said, can I come release the butterfly there? Cause I know there's at least flowers. It'll live for a little bit. They said, well, it might get in our fans. They go, but at least it's out by the flowers. So you know, you never know. They live for, you know, usually it's like two weeks, but yeah, you can raise monarchs and you can raise uh, swallowtails and you can attract them with the plants in your yard, native plants. Um, someone asked, we what can, are the native bushes that can be planted under trees? We have a whole uh, healthy hedges uh, brochure that we hand out from the Morton Arboretum. It would depend on um, the area. Like I would probably get some more information. So if it was wet, wet shade or dry shade but um in general there's a lot of them like um oh witch hazel and some viburnums um you know the the list is is big so uh, the questions you know some of the ones like nine bark they get to be a big tall 20 foot shrub and yet other ones are shorter and um so I would have to ask ask more questions, but there are definitely a lot of different trees and shrubs that fill the lower areas, and even small trees like red bud or pagoda dogwood fill a, a middle sized niche. Yeah, the, the the red bud and the the pagoda dogwood and the service bear, what they call understory trees, which exactly what they are. You have the tall oaks, and these are like the understory trees, so they can tolerate some shade. Um, and they and like the service berry has great berries for the birds. Uh, that's a great one and uh, plant for that or to attract them also. And also, I just want to hydrangea. Yeah. There's yeah. you know yeah. a, a lot of different things that um, 
that we can recommend for the yards? Yeah, smooth hydrangea and oak leaf hydrangea are, what, are two shrubs that actually tolerate quite a bit of shade. Um, and they're great for filling in hedges and stuff. Uh, Margaret helped me out here. She said spice, spice, I can't say it, spice bush and tulip trees also uh, attract swallowtail as host plants. Thank you, Margaret. So right now, that's all the questions we have. Um, and we wanna thank everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulty and getting a little late start here. Uh, for some reason, my Zoom link wouldn't start up on me. Um, so thank you, everyone. Is there anyone, that, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you, Jim, for your presentation. Sure. And uh, thank you for attending our Conservation Foundations and the Downers Grove Public Works Department presentation on uh, attracting birds and butterflies to your yard. And uh, I'll send out a recording of this. And I'm all, I will also send out information with the dates of the upcoming plant sale with Downers Grove Public Works. So you can purchase those native trees and shrubs uh, there and get a rain barrel. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.